So our next speaker is Dr. Sarah Pavitt. She's our Associate Chief of Pediatric Neurology and the Chief of our Pediatric Headache Division. She did her undergraduate at the University of Colorado and medical school at Chicago Medical School and did her pediatric neurology training and headache fellowship at Stanford. Um, joined us here about three years ago as a going to talk to us today about um, updated treatment for pediatric migraine. Thank you, Dr. Pavitt. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today um, and for coming to learn just about neurology in general. Um, I am really excited to talk to you today about navigating headaches in pediatric patients. These are my disclosures. Today we're going to talk about defining diagnostic criteria for pr different primary headache disorders. We're going to describe the epidemiology and impact on migraine and compare different treatment management options for headache care in pediatric populations in the outpatient setting. So let's start with a patient that I feel like most of you probably see daily in your clinical practice. AJ is a 14-year-old female. She has a past medical history of seasonal allergies and asthma, presenting for your, to your clinic for evaluation of headache. She describes that she's been having headaches occurring for the last month. They've really started one headache a week, but now over four weeks have been having daily and continuous pain. She's described bitemporal pain, and two, and three, two to three episodes of the month are really severe and activity limiting. The headaches usually start in the morning upon awakening. You guys just heard about the potential red flag from Dr. Kyla Cabarra. However, she says that she has associated photophobia, phonophobia, and nausea. But that nausea and vomiting in the morning when she wakes up. So I want to start talking about secondary headache red flags. When do we need to really be concerned that this is not a primary headache disorder? When we have an acute onset of headache, with rapid escalation and worsening of pain, that's a red flag for me. Now I say that acknowledging that every headache disorder has to start at a certain time. So you are going to see patients where this is their first headache attack. But that rapid escalation of severe debilitating pain, those are red flags for me. The worst headache of life or a thunderclap headache. This has a very specific diagnosis. So you have to have maximal intensity of headache within one minute of onset. These patients, these headaches, hit them like a ton of bricks. They are okay, and then within a minute, they're kind of on the floor because they're in 10 out of 10 pain. A positional component to your headache. I say this knowing that most patients with migraine do want to lay down. It makes them feel better to rest. But if you have a patient who every time they sit up, they immediately get a headache, that makes me concerned that they may have a CSF leak causing a low pressure headache or every time in the morning they're waking up with a nagging, awful headache that gets better throughout the day, that might be concerning for increased intracranial pressure. Headaches that are triggered by Valsalva. We heard a little bit about this, but for headaches that a kid does not have any headache pain and they cough or they poop and that triggers a headache to happen, those would be concerning red flags for increased intracranial pressure or Chiari malformation. Side-locked headaches. Patients who have side-locked headaches and truly side-locked, always on the right side. It doesn't move. It's always right here. It never crosses midline and is never on the left side. That's a red flag. We oftentimes can see that these patients have pituitary abnormalities or other skull-based lesions like meningiomas. Um, and so oftentimes for those patients, I will get imaging. And then any time on your neurologic exam when patients are not having a headache and they have a focal neurologic deficit, that should warrant a, taking a step back. What are some myths? Occipital headaches. So this has been kind of throughout the literature thought of as a big red flag. Headaches in the back of the head. They've actually done really large studies in the emergency room where they brought patients in and looked at all different types of headaches. And while patients who had an occipital location for their headache did have a higher likelihood of having abnormal imaging, all the patients who had abnormal imaging also had an abnormal neurologic exam. So if I hear a patient who has an occipital headache, that just makes me take a step back and say, okay, I wanna be a little bit more detailed and make sure I'm looking thoroughly through that neurologic exam. And if that's normal, that's really reassuring and not a patient that we need to image. 
Headaches with associated cranioautonomic features. Redness of the eyes, tearing of the eyes, nasal congestion, runny nose, changes in pupil size, ptosis. These are really common symptoms of migraine. Anywhere between 30 and 60% of patients will have these symptoms along with a migraine attack. This goes back to a lot of people being diagnosed with sinus headache because during their headache, they can get redness of the eyes, they can get congestion. But if that's not happening outside of their migraine attack, it's probably just part of their migraine and has nothing to do with sinus or allergies. So let's go back to our case. In AJ's case, she did have quite a few red flags. Headaches recurring once a month. They started once a week and are now daily and continuous. And she's having morning headaches that are waking her up in the morning with associated vomiting. So what do we think about the diagnosis here? This is the International um, Classification for Headache Disorders. We're on our third edition. This is a free um, resource. It's available for everyone. I have the website up here it lists out the diagnostic criteria for all of our headache disorders. So it is a fantastic resource if you have a patient sitting in front of you and you're trying to determine what type of headache disorder does my patient have. I wanna briefly go over some of the most common ones. First, tension type headache. This is the most common type of headache. To make this diagnosis, you need to have at least tenic tacks, and these attacks can range between 30 minutes and seven days. So they can be very short, they can be very long, but they have to have what I look at as two plus two. They have to have any of the two of the following. Bilateral pain. Normally kids will talk about this as pressing or tightening. Not aggravated by activity and mild to moderate pain. For these patients, when they get headaches, they have a headache, but it's not typically causing disability. It's not causing them to miss school, to miss their family functions, to not be able to go out with their friends. It's kind of that nagging headache that, ugh, I don't like, but I can get through my day. It also does not have a lot of secondary features. It cannot have nausea or vomiting associated with it. As soon as you have that, you move into migraine. And you can only have one of either phonophobia or phonophobia. So when I think about these patients, these are patients who are coming in they can have very frequent headaches, but it's not causing disability. They're not having to go lay down in a dark, quiet room because of this headache pain, and they're not having a lot of other symptoms along with it. It's truly this kind of isolated headache that's coming and going. We contrast that to migraine. For migraine, you need to have at least five attacks. And it's funny because when these tend to start, I've seen patients who've had three of these in their life, and so it's kind of like we're making the diagnosis, but we need a couple more attacks. So in the pediatric population, sometimes we don't see them. We see them earlier than that five attack uh, minimum. But they need to have two plus one. This pain in the adult population needs to be unilateral, and it can be bilateral in the pediatric population. So that's a little bit harder because in tension type headache, we said bilateral pain. Also, migraine in the pediatric population still tends to be bilateral. Tends to be throbbing or pulsating and worsened or aggravated by activity. These patients don't want to keep doing their daily activities. They want to take a break. They want to rest. And it's moderate to severe pain. There's also many other associated features. So they have to either have nausea and or vomiting or photophobia and phonophobia. I'm gonna highlight some changes here between pediatric migraine diagnosis and adult migraine diagnosis. Migraines tend to be short lasting, um, anywhere between two and 72 hours. In the adult population, it's four hours. So they tend to be a little bit shorter in the pediatric population. I already mentioned this, but in the peds population, they tend to be bilateral. We start to see that unilateral, unilateral, unilateral pain coming on through adolescent and early adulthood. This is my favorite part. We can infer associated symptoms. If you ask a kid, are you sensitive to light and sound? Almost all of them are gonna say, no, I feel fine. But then you ask them, what do you do during your attack? Could you be outside in the sun or would you prefer to be in a dark room? Oh no, I wanna be in a dark room. That's photophobia. Can you be out with your siblings screaming and fighting or do you need to go into a quieter environment? 
Oh no, my siblings drive me nuts during these, high, my, these headache attacks. There's no way. That's inferring this photophobia and phonophobia. So getting to be a little bit of an investigator and really taking that careful history can be very helpful. What about our frequent headache disorders? Chronic migraine, to make this diagnosis, you need to have a diagnosis of migraine and really having 15 or more headache days a month for more than three months. That's in contrast to new daily persistent headache. So these are really our two most common chronic headache disorders. This is a very interesting entity where patients have a very clear and distinct onset of continuous and daily pain that within 24 hours becomes that daily and continuous pattern and is present for more than three months. These patients will literally tell you, on April 14th, I woke up with a headache and it has not gone away. They have a very distinct remembrance of that onset. These patients are, from, in my practice, a red flag, and these are patients that I will do more work of an investigation to. So coming back to our case with AJ, um, she ends up getting a brain MRI, and that MRI is normal, which is wonderful. But then it comes to what is our diagnosis here? We end up diagnosing her right now with migraine without aura, but she has had rapid intensification of her frequency, so she would be a potential evolving into chronic migraine. This is the perfect time to intervene for treatment because we know that if we can intervene early, we have a much better chance of converting that chronic headache uh, pattern into an episodic headache pattern. So what is migraine? Um, what is going on? What is happening? So we know that migraine tends to be a genetic disorder. If you have one parent who has migraine, you have about a 50% chance of having migraine yourself. Two parents, about a 75% chance of having migraine. Having those migraine genes means that your nervous system is built just a little bit more hypersensitive than someone who doesn't have migraine. So it has a harder time integrating all the sensory information into our environment. Light, sound, sleep deprivation, stress, that migraine nervous system has a harder time integrating and triggers attacks. So when you have that difficulty with integration, that's that change in homeostasis. We actually see alterations in the vasculature of around the brain and the dura that leads to this release of neuroinflammatory peptides. That interacts with multiple areas of the brain throughout the brainstem, the midbrain, and then out into the cortex, which gives us all of the symptoms that go along with migraine. And I use the word migraine purposefully and not just headache, because we know that migraine is so much more than a headache. These are the distinct phases that happen during a migraine attack, and when these phases are occurring, different parts of the brain are activated. So typically you start with a premonitory phase, where people start to have cravings. This is really interesting. So the idea of chocolate or food triggering migraine, it may actually be that that migraine has started and they're just having a craving. You actually get increase in yawning, fluid retention, and this heightened perception. So they may tell you that lights seem to bother them even before that headache starts. In about a third of patients, they'll have an aura. That aura typically are positive symptoms, so vision changes, sensory changes, language changes. This is coming from a wave of cortical spreading depression that starts in the back of the brain in the visual cortex, which is where you get those rainbow lights, those zigzag lines. And as it slowly moves over the brain, it oftentimes will hit your sensory cortex. You'll get the spreading of sensory changes, numbness and tingling that start in the hand and then they go up to the face. And then as it continues to move forward, difficulty with speech, difficulty finding words, difficulty understanding words. An aura is much different than a stroke. Auras have to start and grow and change over time. So it's something that starts in one place and gets bigger. It has to last at least five minutes. Strokes hit people like a ton of bricks. All of a sudden, I can't feel an entire arm. I can't feel, I can't use one side of my body. Auras are different because of that progressive nature of them. You then lead into the headache phase, and this is where we get the most disability because they have moderate to severe pain and a lot of other um, associated symptoms. Once that headache phase is over, you then get this post phase, which a lot of people will describe as kind of this hangover phase where they just feel tired, exhausted, they still have difficulty concentrating. So when we diagnose patients with migraine, we need to understand that we're diagnosing them not just with a headache, but they're experiencing this for a much longer period of time. 
Migraine is incredibly common. It's the third most common illness worldwide and affects about 39 million people in America. When we think about the overall prevalence, <clears throat> it's about 12% overall, with more males, or sorry, more females than males. However, I love in the pediatric population, until puberty, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio. And it isn't until after puberty that we start to see it affecting more females than males. Typical age of onset in the pediatric population is anywhere between the ages of seven and nine. So young kids get migraine. That's when it starts. Chronic migraine, I hear this all the time. There's no way my kid can have chronic migraine, they're too young. Unfortunately, that's, not ju that's just not true. About 0.6% of children between the ages of five and 12 have chronic migraine. That goes up to 0.8 to 1.8% of adolescents. This is chronic migraine, really, really frequent headache attacks. It's about 1% of adults. That's about the same as epilepsy. So when we think about the just vast number of patients that, of people that this affects, it's pretty incredible. And why do we care about this? Migraine has a heavy burden, heavy load of disability. We know it's the second leading cause of disability worldwide among all comers, second to back pain. In age groups between 16 and 46, it is the number one cause of disability. We know that it tends to affect all aspects of life, occupational, academic, social, family, personal. People who have migraine um, have about $9,000 of more yearly direct and indirect costs compared to those who don't have migraine. And if you are a working adult, your employer will probably spend around $2,600 more a year on patients who have migraine. And we know that patients who have chronic migraine tend to have more disability, headache impact, low so socioeconomic status, and increased healthcare utilization and costs. What about in pediatric the pediatric population? We know that children with migraine miss more school and perform more poorly in school than their headache-free peers. Just like adults, a dose effect occurs. So patients who have chronic migraine tend to miss even more school and have more disability than those with episodic. This is really interesting and important. Patients who have, children who have migraine with associated nausea tend to miss more school than those who don't have nausea. So that nausea is a really important component to tease out and to treat. We know that children from socioeconomic disadvantaged backgrounds are about four times more likely to experience chronic migraine compared to episodic migraine. And in this really incredible study done at Cincinnati Children's, they found that chronic migraine in the pediatric population had similar disability to rheumatoid arthritis and pediatric cancer diagnoses. So this truly affects every aspect of this child's life, and not only the child's life, but it tends to affect the entire family's life. So it's so important that we not only identify and diagnose these patients, but then once we do that, how do we think about treating them? I talk about migraine treatment as a pyramid with a foundation of my pyramid being lifestyle regularity and then really making sure we have kind of a holistic plan. When we think about lifestyle regularity, I think about trigger modification. Now, triggers, they did a really cool study where most people identify more than 20 triggers to their migraine attacks. So I don't tell families to go and really just scour and get nervous and anxious about everything that could trigger migraine because we know they're cumulative. They may be fine one day being out in the sun, but if we're during AP testing and we're out in the sun and we didn't sleep last night, that could, combination could be our trigger. But if there are consistent triggers, we try and modify them. I talk to patients about consistent sleep schedules, going to bed and waking up at the same time each day, but we know that actually the wake-up time is more important. So I tell them between weekdays, weekends, only a two-hour difference where patients are sleep, you know, waking up at 6 a.m. in the morning on Mondays and then 1 p.m. Um, on weekends, that can be really disruptive. That also completely throws off our meals. So right now, there's no significant evidence to recommend a migraine diet. But what we do know is that migraineurs like consistency in their meals. So meals around the same time each day. We talk about adequate hydration. I joke that in Texas, we literally, there is no limit. In the summer, just keep drinking water all the time. Limiting caffeine for caffeine withdrawal headaches, and then the importance of exercise. 
They did this amazing study in adults where they asked them to exercise for 40 minutes three times a week or take Topamax every day in episodic migraineurs to prevent migraine. Both group had the same reduction in headache frequency. So exercise was just as good as taking a pill. I talk about the importance of educating the patients, the families, and this is a fantastic resource for providers as well. HeadacheReliefGuide.com, this was created by Mercy Children's up in Kansas City. Um, this website, I would bookmark it. Your patients can go here. They, can, they have a ton of videos and interactive ways for families to learn about migraine. But from the provider side, they also allow you to create specific treatment plans that you can print off for your families. School and school accommodations. This is one that I can't stress enough. Migraine, like I said, tends to disrupt school. And so it does qualify children for 504 accommodations. I encourage you to provide those for families, to allow them to have extra time on test if they have a migraine. Allow them to carry water, and because I'm asking them to carry water, they can go to the bathroom without having to ask. Being able to have their medication to treat their migraine in the moment at school. Migraine at School is a fantastic organization. It's doing a ton of advocacy around the country to bring awareness and stop the stigma that's going on around the country for our teens in school. If you reach out to them or connect with them, they can give you these amazing flyers. They're getting integrated into PTAs around Texas and the entire country. So it's a great advocacy support and place to send patients. So once we talk about lifestyle and all of those things and trying to optimize the holistic patient, I then move to prevention. The whole goal around headache prevention is really to try and calm down that hypersensitive nervous system. And really, we should be providing preventive strategies to anyone who's having more than four migraines per month. We know that there's a dose response. So once you get past that four a month, you tend to have a higher likelihood of converting into chronic migraine. So offer prevention early. We know that if we combine medications with behavioral therapies, they tend to be more, most effective. And start one strategy at a time. Um, I'm going to talk about different nutraceuticals or vitamins for migraine management. Start one preventive at a time and give an adequate trial, six to eight weeks. Telling families it's going to take six to eight weeks for us to know if this is helpful, but that really allows us to see if the medications are working, but also limiting side effects from polypharmacy. I tell all families that my goal is a 50% reduction in headache days. So it's not that it's going to completely take away your migraine. We don't have a cure for migraine yet but I want to see a 50% reduction in your headache days. There was a really wonderful trial, um, again, done out of Cincinnati Children's, trying to understand what is the best prescription preventive for pediatric migraine patients. They took episodic migraine patients and randomized them into Topamax, amitriptyline, or placebo. This is called the CHAMP trial. It was ended early because all three groups had the same reduction in headache frequency meaning that placebo seemed to be as good as the medications. Now, there's a lot of nuances with this study. It was episodic migraine. They were also seeing a headache center, getting headache education, getting the diagnosis and understanding it. But from that trial, the way that I have changed my practice is that I start all of my patients on a nutraceutical. There are four of them that have evidence that are helpful in migraine, melatonin, riboflavin, CoQ10, and magnesium. You can see the doses here. I start everyone, six to eight week trial. I do one at a time, I don't combine them. If this is not helpful after a nutraceutical trial, if we haven't found benefit, I then turn to pharmacologic preventives. These are the three with the most um, evidence for them, propranolol, emetriptyline, and topiramate. I will tell you from a preventive perspective, topiramate is the only FDA-approved medication uh, for migraine prevention in the pediatric population, and it only goes down to 12. However, um, this medication can work well, but I do say to use caution in our adolescents and our kids who are trying to just achieve in school because it does cause a lot of cognitive slowing, slowing and difficulty thinking. So I tend to start propranolol or amitriptyline as my first line pharmaceutical. I put this next slide up, not that you need to memorize it or know it, but this is how I frame migraine prevention in my mind. With all of the different strategies and options, especially as the treatment landscape has really changed over the last five years. So when I talk to families, a lot of them come and say, 
oh, I've tried one or two things. There's nothing left. And I'm like, no, we have so many things that we can do and try. Finally, the acute part of our treatment. What to do, how to treat an attack in the moment. This should be given to all patients when we diagnose migraine. If you make that diagnosis, it's so important for families to go away knowing how to treat an attack when it happens. We know that if we treat when it's mild, it's most effective. If you're waiting eight hours into your migraine, that medication probably is not gonna work. So you need to treat early. Maximize dose if you're not having side effects before changing your acute medication. And normally I tell families we need to at least try to treat two to three attacks before I know if it's helpful or not. I tend to start a multi-layered approach. So I start with an NSAID, most of the time naproxen or ibuprofen, and then add on a triptan if needed. We know that the combination of a triptan and an NSAID is more beneficial than just one alone. Triptans, I'm gonna show you a list of them. They're contraindicated in patients with cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease. I feel very blessed as a pediatrician because most of our patients don't have these comorbid, comorbid conditions. To note, there is very little, if any, concern about serotonin syndrome using a triptan and SSRIs or other mood stabilizers. The reason being is that triptans act on different serotonin receptors that are not involved in serotonin syndrome. So when they've actually looked back at all of this, it's almost impossible to get serotonin syndrome from triptans and other mood stabilizers. So you should feel comfortable using them in those patients. Offer an antiemetic to all patients with migraine, with nausea. It's going to help kids get back into school. I normally start with Zofran. And I say, if we're having significant nausea with your migraine, especially at the beginning of the attack, start with your Zofran, get that in your body, and then take your migraine medications. I want to put this up here. This is um, thinking about triptans in general. So there are seven different triptans. The ones that are bolded, the four that are bolded, are FDA approved in the pediatric population. Rizotriptan goes down to the age of six. The others are at 12 and up. This shows you how many different formulations and routes of administration we have. And so when I'm trying to think about starting a triptan, I typically start with sumatriptan or rizotriptan, and then really move around based on what's going on with efficacy and side effect profile. There are a ton of new medications in the headache and migraine landscape. We have monoclonal antibodies that are injectables that target CGRP. We have oral G-pants that target CGRP. Those are acute or preventive medications. We also have this amazing landscape of neuromodulation, um, devices that help treat migraine that are not medication-based. All of these things are things that we offer at the Pediatric Headache Center here um, and within our neuro neurology department. And so if your patients are having difficulty with these first-line treatments, please refer to us. We're happy to see them. We're excited to see them. Um, and we will talk with them about all these different and new emerging therapies. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so the question was, am I, am I using new CGRP-related medications? We are. So I tend to use them off-label, um, both the injectables for prevention and the oral medications for prevention and acute. I'll also say that we have ongoing clinical trials. So the um, pharmaceutical companies are running clinical trials in children down to the age of six for these medications. So we have active clinical trials going on here um, for patients to enroll as well. Great question. So the, what, <laughs> to what extent are the devices covered by insurance? Um, currently, they're not. However, I will say um, one of the devices called Norivio um, has gotten insurance approval in North Dakota, Washington, D.C., and they just got Medicaid to cover it in one other state. So I think the dominoes are going to start falling, which we are very excited about. Um, the devices range widely in their cost to patients. So there are, Nerivio and Cephaly are two devices that tend to be much more affordable for patients and ones that we tend to use first line. There are three other ones that tend to be a little bit more cost heavy. Antibody, you can put in your arm, right? 
So it's interesting. All five devices work differently. The Nerivio is a device that, yeah, that goes on your arm. It is a prescription. It stimulates pain fibers in your arm in a non-painful way. So it's not distraction. It's actually stimulating pain fibers, which turns on the inhibitory pain pathway in the brain, and that stops your migraine attack. It's very similar. So the triptans work in the same parts of the brain, but we're just doing it without medication. It's wonderful. Right now, the studies are just down to 12. You can use it for prevention or for acute use. Prevention's every other day, acute as needed. It's a 45-minute treatment. And I will say for this company, they've done a beautiful job doing a great clinical trial in the pediatric population, and it is effect as a, or even more effective than some of our medication trials. Great question. So the question was, do we still trial triptans if someone has a remote stroke, off aspirin? I think the biggest question is, what was the etiology of the stroke? Um, if there's any concern for any, so you have the potential for vasoconstriction with triptans. Um, because we've had this enormous growth in the landscape of medications and different treatment options, I tend to not try and use triptans first line. I talk about neuromodulation. I'll try and get them a GPANT approved. We talk about alternative modalities. With that being said, if I have someone who came in with a neonatal stroke and I don't think that they have any ongoing risk factor for stroke, everything has been really stable, for those patients, we'll talk about risk benefits for using a triptan. But it kind of depends on what the etiology of the stroke was. Okay, thank you so much.